special interviews, highlights, and live broadcasts from ICT's annual international conference. Dan Dyker here. We are at IDC uh, International Radio right here on campus and next door to us. Uh, in full swing is the 15th annual World Summit on Counterterrorism here at the IDC Herzliya, and we're talking about uh, important issues here, the importance of law enforcement and terrorism in the heart of the United States, uh, where a lot of the counterterrorism uh, uh, discussion is unfolding. Uh, President of the United States can be seen really as a leader in all aspects, domestic, international, on uh, the issues of counterterrorism, and uh, today is Really no exception, Professor Robert Friedman, the founding director of the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange, as well as Professor Emeritus of Criminal Justice at Georgia State University, uh, an Israeli, uh, um, Israeli by birth and, and, uh, grew, and grew up and worked and then moved to the United States uh, for some years as he has contributed his wisdom on the issue of criminal justice uh, and terrorism, uh, uh, not only in the United States but internationally. What is the challenge, Professor Friedman? First of all, welcome uh, very much to, it's not, I'm saying welcome home, really, is yeah, what good, I'm saying. Good to be back. Uh, what is the, uh, the nexus here in the United States between criminal law, uh, uh, between uh, criminal justice uh, and, uh, and counterterrorism? How much does the United States today have the flexibility from a criminal law point of view to take action and prevent uh, acts of, uh, of uh, Terror. Let me just say that I was not born in Israel. I was actually born in Romania and ah. uh, immigrated to Israel, right. made Aliyah here in 1950. And uh, so practically I grew up here and then I uh, went to the United States for my studies. And after that, I uh, ended up at uh, Georgia State and I've been there since uh, 1986. I'm at the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University. To your question, um, there are two ways of looking at. at uh, uh, terrorist attacks. One is a policy political uh, uh, aspirations to achieve political goals, which is the classical Boaz Ganor definition mm -hmm. of terrorism. And the second one is crime. And I'm somewhere in between those two, but I have a adopted a different model to try and understand both crime and, uh, and terrorism. The problem with the criminal view alone is that what it does, it uh, basically looks at the code book, and if something is not allowed or it defined as illegal, then you are prosecuted on that basis. That is less of an interest to me, and with all due respect to the legal system, if I look at the two of the most heinous crimes in the previous century, uh, those were the, the Holocaust and the... 9-11. No, no, I'm not getting to 9-11 yet. Okay. I'm talking about the Holocaust, and I'm talking about the, the genocide in Rwanda. Okay. Those were the only two incidents that I'm aware of that actually somebody was tried and convicted for it. That's when we talk about the legal system. And the problem with that is that it was way after the fact, and I doubt that it had a great deal of deterrent effort. So to me, as a criminologist, I'm actually interested not so much in why people commit crimes, but why people do not commit crimes. Then you move on to the private case of a criminal behavior, and that is terrorism. And then I look at the epidemiology of crime. And I like to adopt, and I've done that before, the public health model. If you want to deal with an acute event, say a heart attack, and you bring that person to the emergency room, with modern technology, if you bring the person in a timely fashion, uh, you are not only likely to save the life, but also to improve its quality for years to come. All right. So how does that work in the criminal justice just application? About, I okay. was just about to say that. If you want to deal with cardiovascular diseases, the ER is not the response. In other words, emergency intervention will do very little to change the epidemiology of that uh, disease, so to speak. And that is the same for crime, whether you deal with uh, homicide or rape or robbery or aggravated assault or any of the part one crimes, uh, including property crimes. In other words, the human behavior is one that is of choice. In other words, you have a uh, gamut of choices and the criminal or the terrorist opt to make a choice of a certain type of behavior. And therefore, 
the terrorist attacks are not different than a criminal uh, uh, performance, if you will, by somebody who violates the law. And therefore, looking at the behavior offers a much greater hope to surgically intervene in changing the behavior. And the law, I'm not sure, is the one that will do that. But when you look at terrorism as crime, which in fact, uh, the blind sheik terror attack, which the first um, twin tower attacks in 1993, that was treated by the criminal justice system as crime and not as a national security event. Well, yes. Here's the dilemma. I can't say that terrorism is not criminal because it is a violation of the law, hence it is criminal. I'm not sure that dealing with terrorism only on the basis of violation of mm. criminal law is sufficient. A, it takes a long time to A, catch somebody if they're still alive. It takes a very long time to, uh, to, prosecute. Uh, to prosecute. And in the United States, uh, even if you convict somebody, there's mandatory appeal, and that is a lengthy and expensive uh, process. It uh, sort of abuses the, the, the legal uh, system, and I'm not sure that that is the best way, and uh, there are ways other than the regular traditional criminal justice system uh, to deal with, with uh, terrorists and the public court. I'm not convinced that that is the, the, the way to do it. This doesn't mean that they are exempt from the judicial system. Uh, they could be brought in front of military tribunals, uh, and that, that is still a judicial process, but a different one than the, the civilian court. Question for you, Professor Breedman. I, I, I'm, you know, as, I'm, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about other models of, of enforcement, uh, using lim more limited rights if it's a national, you know, using the Patriot Act and national security uh, requirements versus the criminal justice system in the United States, and trying to get into the complexity of the issue as you've presented it, because it's very compelling to think out of the box uh, in a combination, as you've mentioned, of the two uh, systems. What about Gitmo? What about Guantanamo Bay? How does that, how do we deal with that? Uh, 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 positive, negatives, how do you feel about it? Well, uh, look, uh, G Gitmo is, is a tactic of a state to respond to a problem, and since the United States is in control of that facility and it decided to uh, house uh, terrorists uh, there, it did. Uh, the president committed to close it down. I'm yet to see that happening, which only goes to point that it's not as simple as it sounds. Uh, to me, that is not that is more of a symptom. That is not the issue. Whether you hold them, I'm not sure that holding them inside the United States is that advantageous uh, to 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 begin with. Uh, the issue is not where you hold them. The issue is, uh, for example, here's a topic that we haven't even discussed yet, but. I'm yet to hear from political leaders, and I'm not even saying statesmen or statespersons because I'm not seeing that many these days. I'm not seeing a clear-cut condemnation of terrorist attacks. And when I see it, it's relatively selective. Can you give, me, can you give us an example when you, when you say you know, clear-cut condemnation? What are you thinking about specifically? What I'm thinking about is that if there's a uh, terrorist attack in a train station, on a bus, in a coffee shop, in a hotel, whether it's in Bali or in or Boston. Cape Town or yeah. Boston or any place else, the leaders of the free world, I'm not even expecting anything from anybody else, need to in unison, basically state that this is unacceptable uh, behavior. It's unacceptable conduct. You hear a lot of lip service. For example, we're yet to hear a significant, unequivocal condemnation of the September 11 atrocity. I haven't heard that. I mean, from Western leaders, yes, but not from leaders who matter and those who can make a difference. And I think that to, in the fight against terrorism, we are missing the legitimacy of the aggrieved. Mm -hmm. And the aggrieved are those who the act of terrorism is perpetrated against them. And if we don't see that, there's almost a sense of, we don't really want to know what Bin Laden and his associates say. I mean, who wants to, to read that? I mean, we read the Reza Report, we read the horoscope, we read other nonsense in the newspapers, but who wants to read the daily screeds that are published by those who want to do us away? Wait, are we saying here, Professor Friedman, that after, let's take 9-11 because it's something of clue that all our listeners uh, are familiar mm -hmm. with. 
either, well, even though the listeners who were under 25 were Minimum. quite young. Yeah, that's it. But let's take 9-11. Uh, are we saying here that there was not, in your view, enough uh, condemnation from the leaders of free states around the world, three countries around the world, regarding that atrocity? No. You're talking about 9-11. This is of a totally different magnitude and class. I'm talking about a bus. I'm talking about a coffee shop. I'm mm-hmm. talking about the hotel. You're talking about a general lack of moral clarity on the yes. point of government leaders with regard to terrorism. Exactly. I see. And, and, when, I see. You, and when you hear that, it's relatively selective. Uh, you don't hear that uh, on, a, on a regular, on a consistent basis. I don't see terrorism sort of becoming a priority and hence the importance of this uh, annual convention because it it brings that to the forefront on a regular basis now people in the united states for example look at 9-11 as something that happened you know there's a ground zero side that it's nice to visit and it's very uh, awe-inspiring becomes entertainment it becomes uh, yeah and actually you have to pay to get into the museum so, so yes but I think there's there's an element that is even even more more serious than that. The the, the entire uh, gamut of the language that we use is devoid of the meaning. I mean, you just said 9/11. So for the those that are very young, if they don't know the history books and they don't Google that term, they don't even know what it is. They think it's a date. I always, when I say 9-11, I try to say the 9-11 atrocity because mm-hmm. then somebody says, what do you mean by the atrocity? They don't know what 9-11 was. And there are unfortunately quite a number of these dates, like the 7-7 in London or the March 11 in Madrid, and then there are much smaller scale incidents that are coming time and again. And what we're seeing today, and I'm just pointing to an outcome, there's if not a legitimization, there is a sort of an acceptance of living with a certain level of terrorist attacks whereby the lives of human beings does not matter. And particularly if it's not close to our neighborhood. Okay? The closer it is to our neighborhood, the more it, the more it matters. Um, I don't see the resilience of the free world in terms of, of not accepting that as what the perpetrators claim, it's the heroic entitlement to do. And I think that that is where we're missing the narrative because that is what is really unacceptable. That is where the shaming and the condemnation needs to come in because that needs to be unacceptable under any circumstances. Professor Freeman, I want to take that point of, of moral clarity, is what you're raising, in, in terrorism, uh, against terrorism, counterterrorism, and move our conversation a little bit to one side to the issue of uh, what's known as um, political warfare, uh, uh, loosely stated. You attended uh, today and participated uh, quite actively in a counterterrorism workshop on what's known as BDS, Boycott, Divestment, Sanction, and the nexus between that idea and terrorism and anti-Semitism. Now, just before we went to on the air, you, you mentioned to me um, a rather far-reaching point, and you said, you know, this BDS, this Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions assault is no less a strategic or even existential threat in the context of terrorism, counterterrorism, than terrorism, military terrorism that we know. Help us understand your thinking on that. Well, I, in fact, the topic of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow morning is the bark and the bite. Uh, a, a lot of people don't pay enough attention to what people say. They pay attention to what people do. I actually look at the continuum, and the continuum starts with the bark. And I believe, unlike most uh, cliches, that barking dogs do bite. And uh, I don't know a lot of people who want to be close to a very vicious barking dog because they will bite you. So if you look at the entire continuum, and if you go back to not that long ago, but the period of the Holocaust, what did you have? You had hate, vilification, incitement to violence. You then had violence. It ended up with a horrendous, uh, what we now call the Second World War, in which uh, unfathomable scores of millions of people have died. The estimation is between 80 to 85 million. And I'm talking about those who were murdered, those who uh, died for their country, be that uh, not just the Allied forces, but you know Germans and Japanese and, 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 and citizens who were bombed from the air and so on and so forth. There's no justification 
for that kind of human loss. And, and I think that somehow in this conversation, I'm, I'm personally, and this might be my opinion alone, I'm, I'm dismayed to see how the free world is rushing to have business contracts with Iran and they care more about that, which I understand the importance of you know, business development, but they care more about that than about the human lives that are lost because of Iranian actions, tacit and explicit support. You know, on that point, uh, Professor Freeman, on the mainstreaming of the Iranian regime, uh, and the fact that President Obama said himself that it is its behavior on the ground is not part of the deal, uh, when in fact the Israeli position, and many support that in the United States, is that the Iranian regime's behavior is the entire point. Not that it's not only is it not related; it's absolutely the point uh, that um, uh, that this deal should rise or fall upon. Because uh, what has happened is that the, the thousands of businessmen and women and the major powers in the free world have completely legitimized the leading state sponsor of terrorism in the world. Uh, whether or not they have a nuclear weapon is another issue. Uh, but uh, but clearly, in, in estimating their behavior, one of the concerns that I've had, and I'm quite interested to hear your take on this, is that the mainstreaming and legitimizing of the Iranian regime make them a financer and purveyor of boycott, divestment, and sanctions as a legitimized regime. I can see them, you know, they have their Al-Quds, uh, their Jerusalem Day on behalf of the Palestinians every year, and now they'll be inviting major uh, international businessmen and women from IBM and other corporations, uh, computer corporations and car corporations around the world, and expose these, uh, you know, international people of goodwill to this uh, vicious and atrocious uh, assault, political and and um, cultural and economic assault against the nation state of the Jewish people. That's what that's what seems as in the context of our discussion on BDS. That's what uh, a con it raises a concern for me. Well, for IBM, it will not be the first time that they will be on the wrong side because they helped Nazi Germany at the time, and I think that uh, the Ford Motor Company was involved in that level of support as well. So, so leave the the Iran uh, the deal. Up aside because I don't want to get into that, uh, there's not enough time to deal with it in this, in this interview. I would just say this, the Iranians have been a state sponsor of terrorism since the rise of Khomeini to power. There's nothing new about that. It's well known, it's well documented. The freeing up of an estimated $150 billion uh, will definitely not curb the hunger to influence world politics via a variety of terrorist attacks, either by person or by proxy, and they have enough proxies to carry out what it is that, that they want. Iran is looking for regional and world hegemony, and those who don't believe that only need to measure the distance of the ballistic missiles that reach well beyond Israel. They can reach well into Europe, and if- Moscow. Moscow, and not at the moment. Uh, well, they can reach technically, but they will not do that because Moscow is a major supplier of, of uh, important essential uh, um, uh, uh, items to, to Iran. Unt they until they stop supplying. <laughs> it depends on those politics. Right, aspect. right. But, but then when you look at uh, the possibility of taking a, even a dirty bomb, not to say a nuclear bomb, and then drop it on the United States from the Latin American Triangle, uh, it's not that far-fetched as, as, as it sounds. So Iran is a menace, and the only thing that I will say about the deal is that the mere fact that the Iranian agreed to it shows how bad the deal is. Yeah, absolutely. And then let's just finish on this BDS point. I know that, and, and, and you can handle this any way you'd like. On, on, from where you sit at Georgia State, um, as a major academic and, and um, you know, um, also in the, directly in the issues of, of law enforcement and counterterrorism, I want to get back to, to, to BDS, to this whole um, uh, a political, economic, cultural, multi-front assault against Jewish people in this, and, and the state of Israel. How are you seeing it from there? Are you uh, on campus and other campuses? And why do you think it's such a, a threat, besides the bark and bite thing? Well, it, it's not beside, it's exactly that. I mean, if you bark a lot, eventually you're going to bite. And what the BDS is trying to do is undermine the moral ground on which the state of Israel is standing. Without and, regard to borders, without regard to anything. No, no, I mean, if, if, you look, if you look at the own material, the very own material, so he, here's what you see. It's not just uh, boycotting so-called products from the territories, what they call the occupied territories. For them, 
It's basically undoing the state of Israel. Whether they will undo it violently or they will undo it in any other way, what they are doing now is the direct continuation of the economic boycott that started in 1948 and eventually fizzled out and was not effective. But since the Durban uh, conference in uh, 2001, 2001 uh, they have been uh, frantically uh, engaged in a, a worldwide campaign, uh, basically in each of the continents from Australia to, to North America, and they have been very effective for the long run. I'm not so sure that they are effective now, but they are very effective in the long run uh, in terms of washing the minds of not just students, but uh, faculty members. Um, uh, since I'm retired, uh, I can quote George Orwell, who said that an idea is so idiotic that only an academic can come up with it. <laughs> and it is striking yeah. to me to see how academics who are supposed to be knowledgeable, data-driven, have grounded theories, be careful about what they publish, have ideologies mask anything that they do, and uh, uh, support a, 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 a movement that is basically uh, anti-human, inhumane, uh, violates basic civil and human rights, uh, it is unjust, it's egregiously, egregiously uh, unacceptable and it's anti-intellectual. And how those strange bedfellows come together is a little bit of a riddle, but uh, uh, that is, I think, what, uh, what we're up against. And I, I mean, in disagree I'm in disagreement with those who sort of poo-poo the BDS as... Uh, Oh, it's nothing more than just, you know, some young students who... Grassroots, uh, young students. Yeah, they're seeking to find who they are and all of that stuff. This is very serious because in 10, 15, 20 years, they will be the elected officials, they will be the government leaders, and uh, that is quite dangerous. Well, I think we should leave it at that and let our uh, listeners think about the strategic impact and threat of uh, BDS, uh, no less a national security threat than terrorism itself, and an extension of the terror battlefield. Professor, well, go ahead. W w with your permission, please. let me end on an optimistic note, please, because please. This, this is quite morbid, and I didn't want to end on a bad note. I, I would say that things are not as either masochistic or sadistic as, as they look. I believe, and I very strongly believe, that the way to cope with it is by exercising locus of control, is by being proactive, is by developing partnerships. And uh, we have had 70 years ago or so uh, been uh, overly passive. I think that those days need to be over. Uh, we need to be very active and not, not let that, uh, that propaganda needs to be counteracted in the most effective way. And I think that's where the hope lies. Taking control of the battlefield. Absolutely. There we have it, uh, Professor Robert Freeman the founding director of the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange and a renowned professor emeritus of criminal justice at uh, Georgia State University, uh, United States of America. We're really delighted to have you here on IDC International Radio. You've given us an awful lot to, to bite off and think about, to use a mixed metaphor. And uh, we'll be looking forward, as we've had you in the past, to have you again uh, to share your experience with us here at uh, IDC International Radio. This has been Counterterrorism Today. I'm Dan Dyker. Thank you. Thank you very much.